As you might already have gathered, my name is Andy Mabbott. My Twitter name and my Wikipedia username is Pigs on the Wheel. No about trans uh, I mentioned my Twitter name. I have been using Twitter today to tweet about this event. It doesn't seem that anybody else is here is doing so. So if you do use Twitter, uh, please join in and feel free to comment on what I'm about to say. The hashtag is Glam Herbert, G L A M Herbert, all one word. So, uh, a few months ago, uh, I was asked if I would be interested in being the Wikipedia ambassador, uh, uh, the outreach ambassador, to a project called Archive, uh, which that's not supposed to happen, excuse me, uh, which runs this website. And as you can see from the top left, David Attenborough is involved, he's one of the patrons. So I can have it on my CV and I will be getting that. Um, Archive is run by a charity called Wild Screen, which was set up by Sir Peter Scott and other people. Um, and it came out of the Wild Screen Film Festival, which was a film festival for natural history filmmakers. Um, Wild Screen are based in Bristol with a leadership natural history leaders, and there's a strong culture of natural history filmmaking in general. Uh, Wild Screen run the archive project, so ARK for obvious reasons, uh, as a digital archive of media about endangered species. The original idea being that if a species became extinct, there would at least be a central repository of high quality uh, preserved images, film, and perhaps audio recordings of the species for future generations. Of course, it's much more important that things don't become extinct, so Archive has a big educational role in explaining to people why endangered species are threatened and what can be done to, to help overcome that. Uh, Archive has media donated by just about every big name in the natural history film and media world. So BBC, uh, National Geographic, um, Sky News, uh, all donate some of them. You can see that they're major competitors of each other. That in itself is interesting. But there are also literally thousands of other donors. Uh, talented amateurs, well-known professional filmmakers, Charlie Hamilton James, who did the House of River Diaries program. Um, one of the owners, Spring Watch's name, I forget, Chris Packham, uh, has donated material. Um, and that material is under a restricted license. It comes from very big commercial players who have a vested interest in keeping it for their commercial use. And they generously donate it to this organisation where it can be used by educational institutions and by the charity itself. But unfortunately, that means we can't use it in Wikipedia. However, because they have all these, these images and films of wild species, um, archive employ uh, biologists uh, and people with conservation uh, degrees and so on to write about the species uh, so, so that there are pages that accompany each individual species. Uh, and here is an example page about the common box turtle, uh, which is a, a common turtle in America. And they, in collaboration with Community UK, have agreed to release 200 species texts under a Creative Commons license. So that's just a toe in the wall because they've got thousands and thousands of them, but initially 200 of their articles are available to us to use in Wikipedia. Um, I say that's the one of the common box terms, the way their site works, if you look at the top right there's a load of tabs and that's one section. The full text runs to that length. So it's quite a considerable article about the common box turtle in this case. This is what we used to have on the common box turtle before the project started. And most of it is the nav boxes at the bottom, the informational taxo box on the right, two references, it's actually two mentions of the same source, so it's only one reference, uh, and a list of subspecies. And above that, one paragraph, that paragraph about the species and the subspecies. So that's all the information we have compared to that screen full that I just showed you. And that's one of the articles that that archive and Miles screen very kindly released under a Creative Commons license, which means that our article recently looked like that. Compared to the single paragraph I showed you at the beginning, that's quite a considerable improvement. Most, but not all, of the text that's been added to that article came off the archive site. Roger, I'll get a bit closer to the for me a bit of juice, please. Um, came off the archive site, but the editor who, who 
who volunteered to do the improvement. Once they've done that, thank you. Um, for, well, perhaps I can add a bit more. So I went and found some more sources, and then went to Commons and found a load more images that had been uploaded, <coughs> and improved the article that way. So we have a, a process which has several stages with it. The donated text, that gets brought into the article, and that inspires further improvements. Uh, and we're about a quarter of the way through the 200 articles. So we've got 50 articles that have been either improved like that or improved in other ways as a result of this project. We've run a couple of outreach events uh, in Bristol where we've taught some new Wikipedia editors some indeed skills and got them to improve some articles as well. Those are the references on the uh, common box turf article now, they include the one that I showed you at the beginning. But you can see there there are 16 other references included. When we copy the text from archive, we don't give archive as a reference because all their text reference to the original sources. So we copy across all the reference details. So it's not simply a case of cutting and pasting the entire article. You don't have to go through and tweak all the references. But they, they indicate their references through uh, superscript numbers in the same way that we do. So while it's a little bit of a clerical task, it's, it's not too difficult to work out what goes where. We also attach a template, as you can see there, if you go to the references header, that states where the text came from. So that means the attribution part of the Creative Commons share alike attribution license which they've used. Uh, we also attach a template to the talk page of the article to indicate that it's part of the wiki project. And although you're here today to do some editing about the home vocabulary, I won't complain if anyone wants to go and have a go to including a species article when you're at it. Oh, there's the, uh, the inline references as I say that we provided. This is an extract of the list of 200 articles on the Glam Archive project page and you can see that the ones that have been converted have been struck through. So if you do have a go on the project page, there is a step-by-step -step guide for the new editors as to how to copy the text across, which templates to use, uh, a preferred edit summary for your first edit to show them as part of the project and so on. And then if you strike through the species you've done, it means somebody else won't try and do it and then find they've wasted their effort. The other thing we do is to monitor the statistics as a result of this activity. And you can see there that the days before that spike were so low they don't show up compared to that, that one day. And that's when the article is featured on the main page of the Wikipedia in the Did You Know slot. Any article that is expanded by more than five times its original length can be a candidate to go on to Did You Know. Uh, as can shorter expanded biographies and new articles that reach a certain length. Um, Roger said that the DGN projects, I'm sure you can fill in the gaps with that. But we encourage people who um, improve an article as part of this project by five times the length to nominate it for did you know, you always get it onto the home page. And you can see the effect that has. So if you make a contribution, you're not simply leaving something there for one or two people to look at, but thousands of people will see your work in a short space of time. And that was something that was obviously a motivator. But it's also raising awareness of the plight of the individual endangered species. If it gets people talking about that, thinking about how they use plastic bags or not uh, leaving a tap running or all the other things you can do to help the environment, then that's obviously a good thing. That's not an endangered species. This is nothing to do with the archive project. This is from the Glam Garby uh, project. Uh, Average work or backstage work we had a while ago, which Mike talked about. And I wrote this article during the day, uh, and it's a stuffed pigeon that was in the collection of Derby Museum. There was no article on it at all. Uh, and as the curators here have noted that, the curators at Derby identified subjects they thought would make a good article. And the natural history curator up at Derby asked me if I would like to write this article. Um, and the reason that they've got this stuffed pigeon is twofold. First of all, it was a famous racing pigeon. In 1913, 2,000 pigeons from the English Midlands were taken to Rome and released for a pigeon race. There was then a dreadful storm over Europe, a bit like the one that we had recently, and all the pigeons were thought lost. Until two months later, this one pigeon arrived home. It's the only one of the 2,000 that made it back. And it took two months instead of the expected two or three days. So obviously, got lost or had to take shelter and then had to recover before it could make its journey home. I mean, 
battled up, so quite a true uh, And at the time, it was quite a celebrity. The, the, the newspaper articles written about it, which we had copies of provided by the museum to have them write an article, uh, and it made quite a stir. And the uh, breeder sold that pigeon's progeny at quite a price to other pigeon fanciers on the back of it. Um, then when it died, he donated the uh, carcass to the museum, had it stuffed and, and used this as an exhibit. Uh, and then a local Derby songwriter, a folk singer, heard about it or saw the exhibit and wrote a folk song about it. And she entered in a competition. And the folk singer Jude Taylor was one of the judges, liked the song and recorded a version of it herself, which was a minor hit in the folk world. So then increased the, the fame of the pigeon itself. So this article is about the pigeon race, the stuff skin in the museum, and the folk song. So quite a broad uh, appeal. And I was talking about how this article came to be written just loud, but at an event a couple of months ago, and a guy came up to me afterwards and he had tears in his eyes because it's one of his favourite folk songs. And his wife had taken him to see June Taylor on his 50th birthday, and unbeknown to him, had arranged for June Taylor to dedicate it to him. And he knew nothing of the story of it, he knew nothing about the pigeon race or the fact that it wasn't a made up story, he just knew the song. So it obviously moved him greatly when he heard it. And there is a book of the lyrics of the song with another person's artwork. And he bought the book as a result of reading this article and wrote an article as a, or wrote a review of the book on Amazon, which you can read, uh, referencing my article and the story of how it got written. So you've got layers and layers of the story, a bit like on an onion. Um, but it, it, it's all, amazing, all that came out of one incidental attendance at a backstage event. You don't know how these things are going to grow. And I think Mike mentioned as well that as part of the Derby experiment, we, we ask people to translate articles, and those are all the languages that that little article about this stuff pigeon can be written about. Um, there's, I think they're Belarusian, Catalan, Czech, Esperanto, Spanish, French, Indonesian, Japanese, Russian, and simple English. It's worth mentioning simple English in particular. Um, I don't, do any of you speak another language other than English? So one or two of you might be able to translate articles as part of the Herbert activity. But you can all convert your articles into simple English, which simply requires that you rewrite things in short words, one point sentences of plain language. So that they're available for children, for people with learning disabilities, and for learners of the English language. So do consider working on simple English language versions of articles that you work on as part of the public activity. And just to prove that the translation works, there with my picture of the pigeon is the Japanese version of the article. And of course, a Japanese person who visits Derby Museum, where the pigeon is now back on display, incidentally when I wrote the article it was in store, and they brought it out just for me to photograph. But there was that much interest as a result of this article and the story and the Amazon review, that they put it back on display now with a QRP code on it. And if you scan the code with a phone that's set to work in Japanese, you get that article. Well, there's no way that Darwin Museum would ever pay to have their exhibit labels translated into Japanese and all those other languages. So you can see the benefit of the QRP project. Um, Mike mentioned some of the other land projects, and there's just a list of a few of them, the archive, down amongst the uh, the uh, Museum of Versailles, the New York Public Library, the American National Archives, the Smithsonian Institution, which illustrates the, the, the breadth of coverage of the archive projects. And that's the end of my talk, folks. Um, that QR code will take to my website, not to a QRP article, and please, as I say, do feel free to find me on Twitter. Do you have any questions?
sort of follow through and make sure that we ask people to translate them with a few more than myself. One of the issues with being recruiting was is because we didn't have an event like this to start to kick it off. Um, and as part of that review activity, we will ask our clients if they would like to go and more than 200 articles and they would like to open up all of them. And we're also going to encourage them when they are writing articles to use Wikipedia text. They currently use it as a source, they look at it and then go to our original sources. But we'd like to encourage them to reverse the process where they, we've got an article and they haven't and simply copy it back across and attribute it because our material is available in the Commons license. But in terms of the rest of their article, it's up to them whether they'd like to go down them or not, whether they think they've got anything out of the project. Yeah. How exactly if they did um, release, how would we get them integrated into the articles on that? I think if, if we had that many released, rather than just a couple of hundred, the first thing I would suggest to them would be to look at how many of them would think where Wikipedia haven't got an article, or only have one or two lines stuff, and then see whether we could write a script. It will just bring them across wholesale. Um, you can't do that when you've got an existing article. Um, I didn't show an example, but the common box turned there was one paragraph and then everything else came into the archive. There are some articles where we've got a lengthy article, but we still have four or five paragraphs from the archive article, not all of it, and you couldn't automate that. So it would be a case of perhaps doing some more publicity to make people aware that this is a source that can be copied from rather than simply referenced. But we'll have to stop that one and see. Anybody else? Okay, thank you very much.